Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship at Old Saratoga Reformed Church. We're happy to see those of you who are with us this morning, and we're happy that we have others watching us online. Our worship leader this morning is Dick Behrens. Thank you, Dick, for your faithful service to us. And please join us for Lemonade on the Lawn. over food and made donations and we currently have a profit of just over seven hundred dollars so thank you to everyone who supported that dinner next Sunday our worship leader will be Christopher Tucker and Christopher we thank you in advance are there any other announcements this morning in our prayers we continue to pray for those listed on the prayer list Bill Whitehouse had surgery on Friday. He is recuperating at home, and Duffy said he's in a lot of pain right now, but he is medicated, and we pray that his recovery will go well. And Duffy appreciates and thanks us for our prayers. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and for those everywhere suffering at the hands of others. We pray for peace in regions that are unstable, and we pray for relief for those affected by dangerous weather conditions. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Thank you. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Please join me in the reading of our sentences. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh, you righteous. Praise befits the upright. God loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of God. Truly, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him, on those who trust in his steadfast love. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in God's holy name. The grace and peace of Christ be with you. Please join me in our prayer of adoration. Dear Lord, we adore you because you are great and greatly to be praised. As we look around us, we see your greatness displayed. Creation shows us your wonderful work, your power and beauty in all things. Your holy word reminds us that everything comes from you. 
Everything exists by your awesome power and is intended for our good and your glory. All praise to you now and forevermore. Amen. Our hymn is number 317, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. We come before God not as despised sinners, but as beloved children. With the confidence of the children of God, let us humbly confess our sin, using the words of hymn number 455 as a unison reading. Kind and merciful God, we have sinned in your sight. We have all wandered far from your way. We have followed desire we have failed to aspire to the virtue you ought to display. Kind and merciful God, we've neglected your word and the truth that would guide us aright. We have lived in the shade of the dark we have made when you willed us to walk in the light. Kind and merciful God, we have broken your laws and in conduct have veered from the norm. We have dreamed of the good, but the good that we could, we have frequently failed to perform. Kind and merciful God, in Christ's death on the cross, you provided a cleansing from sin. Speak the words that forgive, that henceforth we may live by the might of your power and word. And let's end with what's in your bulletin. In your mercy and goodness, O Lord, forgive us and strengthen us to do your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I must have needed the last part of that confession more than you did, because I know the instruction said verses 1 through 3. But thank you very much. <clears throat> Hear these words of assurance from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And from Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, 
for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Believe the good news, in Christ you are forgiven. Amen. Readings this morning are from Proverbs 3 and Luke 12. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for the opportunity to gather together to worship you. As we hear these words, help us to clear our minds to better understand your teachings and anticipate the one who is coming. In Jesus' name, amen. From Proverbs. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. And from Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Of the four gospel writers, Luke is deemed to be the most literary. While each author tells us about the life of Jesus in a fashion that's unique to their citizenship, their occupation, and a particular focus, each of these writers ends in a different event. All but one is a past event, and one lies yet ahead. Most scholars believe that Mark's gospel was the first one written, and that Matthew and Mark read quite similarly. It is believed that much of their writings are based in part on Mark's gospel. When you consider how the four books are arranged in the Bible as we have it, one sees that how each account of 
uh, Jesus' life ends chronologically in sequence with the events of Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, I'm, this is something I just discovered, and I'm sure that it's a coincidence, but I find it interesting nonetheless. The book of Matthew ends with Jesus' resurrection from the dead and the commissioning of the disciples. Mark ends with Jesus' ascension into heaven. Luke's account also closes with Jesus' ascension, but includes the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the Gospel of John ends with the promise of Christ's return, the one event that is yet ahead. We tend to read the Gospels thinking that the writers were present on the scene for all of Jesus' wonderful miracles and teachings and that they are giving us an eyewitness account. We think that uh, along the line of them being stenographers, taking down every word that Jesus said verbatim, but this is not the case, uh, and certainly not with Luke. Luke is a Greek who was possibly among the, youngest, uh, the younger converts of the Christian church, and he penned his gospel some 20 to 30 years after Jesus' ascension. Curious, as most, most Greeks of that age tended to be, Luke was a scholar, probably, doubtless, having read Mark, and combined with the myriad stories and traditions passed down wrote of the life of Jesus. Luke is especially known for the stories surrounding Jesus' birth. These reports are the most complete and conclusive and provide us with the rich texts text that we use during our nativity worship. Luke was especially interested in showing us Jesus as the Son of Man, Jesus as the bridge between the Father and all humanity, the Jesus who took, on, uh, who took his divine nature, wrapped it in humanity and became the Son of Man. One preacher has said that Jesus became like us so that we could become like him. Luke was unique among the gospel writers in that the second book he wrote picks up where Luke chapter 24 ends. The book of Acts is, was authored, uh, authored by Luke, starts with the coming of the Spirit on believers and the beginning of what we now call the church. Theologians look upon the books of Luke and Acts really as one book consisting of two volumes. In Acts, Luke relates how the members of the early church lived out the teachings and commission of, the, of Jesus of Nazareth, healing, evangelizing, performing acts of charity, establishing communities of worship. As an example of the carryover from Luke to Acts, uh, consider Jesus' admonishment in verse 32 of Luke 12, sell your possessions and give to the poor. In Acts chapters two and four, Luke portrays the earliest Christian community as actually practicing such acts of charity. Now this is not to say that this uh, practice is a universal command to all disciples, but it is emblematic of the unique spirit in the early church, that being a concern for the welfare of all, frequent gatherings to share meals, and placing high value on the equality of believers. In the Pauline letters to the churches that he has visited, the Apostle Paul refers to the collection he has taken for poverty-stricken Christians in Jerusalem. And so it is to the Greeks and others of his day that Luke's gospel speaks, helping the early Christians to understand how the master desired them to live. Just as it is impossible for us to imagine how life will be 2,000 years from now, uh, Luke certainly did not foresee our day. Yet the teachings of Jesus speak so well to people of all generations that we're able to find meaning in the Gospels and apply the lessons to our daily walk. Today's text from Luke includes a parable, a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. 
In this parable is in two parts. The lessons are about service to God's kingdom and waiting and watching for the full realization, the coming of the kingdom of God. The parable tells us of the behavior that is expected of a slave or servant. In many uh, translations I use that word servant in the place of a uh, slave and we should not be thinking in, uh, as slaves in terms that we think of our own experience here in, in our country uh, several hundred years ago. So I'm gonna use the word servant. Uh, the servants are expected, to, uh, waiting, they are waiting for the master to return from a banquet. And in Jesus' day, uh, these banquets, or it could be a, a wedding feast, were held in homes so that closing time was not a factor. And some banquets could last for 24 hours, some religious festivals as much as seven days. The servants had no idea when the master would re-enter the house. The history of the day also indicates a clear division of labor. Some servants essentially acted as doormen, keeping robbers and other unwanted individuals out, but ready to quickly open the door when the master returns and tending to his needs. Other servants were responsible for lighting, seeing to, to it that there was a steady supply of oil and that all of the lamps were maintained. But nestled in this parable is something truly remarkable and perhaps easily overlooked. The master returns and takes on the role of the servant. And the faithful, obedient servants are the ones who are rewarded. The master, as the scriptures say, fastens his belt, tells the servants to sit down to eat. He comes to them and serves them. Such a radical break with tradition and custom. In the kingdom of God, all conventional norms are thrown out. How great is the love displayed by the son of man that he becomes the servant of all. The same Jesus will serve his disciples at the Last Supper, and the same Jesus feeds us today with heavenly bread. The imagery of the parable shifts to the uh, common New Testament metaphor of the unpredictable thief. The metaphor speaks of the end time, a time that cannot be predicted, and so the need to always be ready Although most of Jesus' uh, Jewish contemporaries prayed for the time of the future redemption, on average, they also seem to be more preoccupied with daily needs and with future glory in God's kingdom or accounting, a time of accounting for their deeds. Our culture today is not inclined to wait either. Think, for example, of how many fast food restaurants there are compared with those who cook the slow, old-fashioned way. Processed and prepackaged dinners are the solution for those who, we, uh, to wish, who wish to eat at home quickly. Credit cards have a great appeal to us because we can buy the things we want without having to wait till we have the cash to do so. When you think of the Bible, waiting is one of the things which men and women of faith are called upon to do. And there's a whole chapter in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, that's devoted to those who had to wait for the promised blessings of God. And here's an example from verses 8 through 10 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he, Abraham, was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And so the wait of these Old Testament saints was even longer than we would like to contemplate. And they are still waiting, uh, as uh, they are dead and they are still waiting uh, for this promise. 
Jesus calls upon his disciples to wait. For although he will return to the earth to rule over it as Messiah, it may be a considerable time before this happens. Our text implies that there will be a wait. And history confirms this because the church has been waiting for nearly 2,000 years for Christ's return. In the context of the coming end time crisis, Jesus underscores the certainty of his return, the uncertainty of its timing, and the present as being an opportunity for faithful service. We are to be alert for the coming of Jesus at all times in our lives. The presence of God, the presence of Jesus is forever dropping in on us in, and intersecting with our lives. It may be a telephone call, a chance encounter with a friend, a conversation with a parent, with a child, grandchild or friend. There are thousands of ways each and every day that the Lord God unexpectedly comes near to us we ought to be alert for his coming. For believers in Christ, Jesus comes unexpectedly into our everyday lives. We need to be prepared to see him, to receive him, to welcome him, and to rise to the challenge of service, which he bids us to do. Jesus in his parables for today is inviting us to always be ready for the return of the master for the kingdom of God does break into our lives. We Christians live with that expectation and alertness that God's kingdom, that God's possibilities, that God's opportunities are forever before us and around us, breaking into our lives. It is being filled with the spirit, the spirit of expectation that Christ is coming to us in the near future. It is having a spirit-filled attitude, the right and expectant attitude, knowing that we ought to be dressed and waiting for action, knowing that we are to have the nightlight on and assuming that Christ will come, knowing that we are to have an ear listening for a knock at the door. These actions all signal an attitude of expectancy that Christ is going to come at any moment into our lives. But we are not to sit by idly while waiting. There is work to be done for the kingdom of God. In our text, Jesus tells us the way to wait for his return. In verses 35 and 36 of Luke 12, Jesus, uh, Jesus spells out three elements involved in waiting, three descriptions of readiness for and expectation of his return that we should have at all times, dressed for action, lamps lit, waiting to open the door. And in verses 37 and 38 of the promise of the blessedness of those who wait in accordance with Jesus' instructions. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds alert. He will come and serve them. My alma mater is Houghton College. And when people ask me where I attended, I tell them, Houghton, Houghton College, to which most say, what was that? What was that that you said? Well, Houghton College is a small liberal arts college in western New York, Allegheny County, for any of you who are geography buffs. It sits in a farming community. The village of Houghton does not have what one would call a main street or shopping center. Houghton is a Christian college that is affiliated with the Wesleyan Methodist Church. The college serves about 1,200 students annually. Its alumni are teachers, doctors, legislators, college professors, ministers of music, speech therapists, among many professions, nurses too, anything. If you have an occupation, they can help you find it. Its alumni uh, include uh, the late George Beverly Shea, baritone, uh, Dr. Richard Mao, former president of Fuller Seminary, who was a student while I was there, Dr. Deborah Burks, who was among the chief White House advisors during the COVID pandemic. You might have seen her on TV or read about her in the newspaper. 
Now, I know you're thinking, what does this have to do with our text for today? And isn't this an odd time to be a college recruiter? Well, I'm not recruiting, and there is a connection with the text. The mention of Houghton College has to do with the college's intended purpose, with its mission statement. These are words and phrases in this statement that you see throughout the college's appeal to prospective students and to the way in which it refers to its graduates. The college's vision is, and I quote, to empower students to serve God and their human communities in a distinctive way. And in that sense, serve is a key word. The vision goes on to say that it is the goal to have its graduates equipped for successful careers, fulfilling their God-given calling to be scholar servants. And you see that term, hyphenated term, scholar servants throughout all of their literature. And here servants is a key word as well. Hence the connection to our text for today. To me, it is very refreshing to hear these words as I get their publications throughout the year, to think about the prospect for building God's kingdom as opposed to having six-figure salaries or a job with a top 50s company as a life goal. Not that these things are not important or worthy of effort, but for the believer, we must put them in place with the more noble goals of God's kingdom. So this morning, I issue the challenge to all of us to become hyphenated servants of God. Whatever your occupation, profession, calling, whatever it is that you are in charge of, let your labors be done with the kingdom and kingdom goals in mind. As we wait for our Savior's return, became known, become known as a teacher servant, a servant teacher, depending on how you would like to say it. So be a servant engineer. Be a servant foreman. Be a servant foster parent. Be a servant scholar. To God be the glory. Amen. Holy God, we again thank you for the words of Holy Scripture. May your word continue to speak to us directing our lives towards faithfulness and obedience so that those around us may know of your love, mercy, and blessings. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn uh, whose words go along with our theme. Uh, it's not a hymn that we know, I believe. God who is giving knows no ending. We're going to sing it to the tune of number 558, which is love divine, all loves excelling. 644. <clears throat>
でしょうね。Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper we are about to celebrate. Is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, He established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never forsaken by Him. We have come to have communion with the same Christ, who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, He makes Himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto eternal life. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine, in whom we must to abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love, of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like him into his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life giving spirit which unites us all in one body, so are we to receive the supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. All baptized Christians, all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ, have reconciled with him and want to serve him, are welcomed at his table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For it is holy and right to do so. Holy and right it is in our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord our Creator, Almighty God, everlasting Father. You created heaven with all its hosts. And the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being, and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior, who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God, and with your whole church on earth. And with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name, singing. <laughs> God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread we break and the cup that we bless may be to us the communion of the body. And blood of Christ. 
grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, told them to eat and to do this in remembrance of him. <clears throat> The bread which we break is our communion in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for this we give thanks to God. In like manner, after they had supped, Jesus took the cup, and he gave thanks and said to them, This cup is the New Testament of the blood of Jesus Christ. For this we give thanks to God. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of him.
The cup of blessing which we bless is our communion in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for this we give thanks to God. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, O Christ, for this feast of life. We are fed by your love. We are strengthened by your life. We are sent forth into this world to live into the visions that God has laid on our hearts. We are now commissioned to feed as we have been fed, forgive as we have been forgiven, and to love as we have been loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together in our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us at your table, grateful for all your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints. We offer to you our prayers for all people. We remember before you the poor and afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity. We pray for those this day who are without power to heat and light their homes. Assure them of your presence. Our thoughts today turn to the people of Ukraine and the people of the states of Kentucky and California. Assist, we pray, all first responders, firefighters, medical workers, and those who work for the relief of victims those who work to bring back light and power. We bring before you the names of family members and friends, members of this congregation, and other members, those listed in our bulletin. And now, as we pause in silence to offer the concerns of our hearts. We pray, Lord, for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all of our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness. We pray that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. May we, as citizens, assume our responsibilities and work for peace and the prosperity of all, all of those who are made in your image and likeness. We pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all children of God. Look, O oh Lord, upon your church. Have mercy on its weaknesses and its unhappy divisions. Increase your church's courage, strengthen its faith, and inspire its witness to all peoples. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our heart and our thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 275. If you were raised in a Baptist church, you may have heard this. Uh, it may be uh, foreign to many of you, but it supports our theme for the day. 
And we're going to sing the, third ver the three verses, but only add the refrain after verse three. Hymn number 275. out for the sopranos there, huh? <laughs> yeah. uh, hear these words of benediction. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.